Greetings customizers, how we doing? To all my subscribers, thank you very much. To all of you joining us for the first time, welcome to Talking Hands Customs. In this next tutorial series, we're going to unlock some of the powers of the airbrush. We're going to talk about airbrushing camouflage. We're going to talk about two types of camouflage, hard-edged and soft-edged. Uh, hard-edged camouflage is something that can also be accomplished with masking and spray cans. It could also be accomplished very well as we've shown with the Slaughter's Marauders Grizzly build that you can definitely do it with a hand brush. So far with an airbrush, what we've done is basically just done straight application and make sure we've had even coverage over a subject. Now what we're going to do is unlock some of the powers of the airbrush to give you what's called a feathered edge or a soft line camouflage. This is something that is done normally on armored and aircraft models and it's done to create special effects for even car models. And in this regard, uh, we're going to do both. So um, the Skyhawk is going to be my subject for this tutorial series and I have two to show you. One's already done and this one we will work on together. And what I'm going to show you for the uh, techniques for the airbrush is I'm going to be demonstrating on a piece of uh, plastic sheet. While it is good to practice and make sure your airbrush is set on something like a clean piece of paper towel, the plastic sheet behaves much like the plastic of a GI Joe vehicle and I want to show you the different patterns of spray that can occur. Now depending on the airbrush you're using and the paints you're using, they have their different ratios for thinner to paint. So I want you to look up what those may be because I can't tell you what all of them are because I don't know. Um, but there is a generic, uh, generic idea in that it should be more thinner in there than there is paint. Um, what that will do is it will create a thinner layer of paint and you may have to do it more than once. However, balancing the thickness of your paint with the airflow and paint flow coming out of your airbrush is what creates the ability to uh, control and create fine lines. And those fine lines have minimal spatter, if any, out to the sides of the pattern. And that's what gives you your soft feathered edge. Um, for inspiration, you can certainly look to G.I. Joe vehicles like the APC, um, its camouflage cover, and potentially even uh, some of the later iterations of G.I. Joe vehicles like the green and brown camouflage Conquest X-30. Um, Slaughter's Marauders has hard line or demarcated camouflage, uh, and that's accomplished through masking. The simple fact is, is that with a spray can, when you're spraying it, it's a fixed pressure and there's a lot of it. Uh, spray cans are not meant for detailed work at this scale. So you're really having to learn how to control that to do it. I'm not going to say it's impossible because I'm sure out there there's some people that can do it. Um, but after a lot of practice, the airbrush itself takes a lot of practice and you'll always be learning from it. Um, I've been airbrushing for several years and I'm still learning uh, tips and techniques for doing it and people more experienced than I have said the same thing. They, uh, one modeler said that their airbrush is always teaching them something new. Um, and that's not to scare you off, especially if you're just beginning with this series of videos. So um, what I'll say is the key to successful airbrush camouflage when it's hard and demarcated is masking off what you don't want paint to go on. Now, if you get a fine enough line out of your airbrush, then minimal masking is required. However, it's never a bad practice to be over cautious and mask off everything else. Uh, with me, I like to tempt fate and force myself to try harder to get that line finer and more controlled. So you'll see me do most masking, depending on how my airbrush is behaving. Um, I've just given it a good thorough cleaning, soaked everything in alcohol and uh, we'll see what happens. But the generic idea is that by changing the, not just the thickness of your paint per se, but modulating the pressure and how much of the trigger you're pulling, right? There's two kinds of airbrushes, the single and the dual action. If you don't remember, the single action only controls how much paint comes out. The dual act, correction, how much air comes out. The dual action controls how much air and how much paint comes out. So my airbrush is dual action and I'll be showing that to you uh, on the plastic sheet and what you can do because it does matter what angle you spray at and what pressure you spray at. Um, for both cases you can change the pressure on your air compressor um, but it is a matter of control with your finger as well. So um, 
With the Skyhawk here, we have a few considerations, uh, especially for this one in particular, and you may have the same thing with yours or whatever vehicle you may be following along with. Uh, in this case, it's a common issue that the uh, one of the canopy retaining pins is broken, and we will be fixing that with some styrene rod, the skill set that we learned in the last build, Intro to Scratch Building. So we'll be repairing that. Uh, if I introduce any new tools along with this, then keep those in mind. Uh, hopefully it's not required. I'm thinking of a certain epoxy putty here, but uh, we'll discuss that potentially later. The other consideration for the Skyhawk is I've done about nine of these already, and I thought that uh, some of them were glued because a caring parent was helping a child fix their toy. Uh, and I never owned one of these. My brother did, but I don't remember him unboxing it. So I haven't seen anybody talk about it either, um, or heard anybody talk about it. And every example I have is glued along this split mark in the fuselage. So um, I've pulled at it, and the risk is that you warp the part or break it. And while we have learned some basic repair skills, there's what I call unnecessary damage. So uh, in looking at this, in this case, this cockpit piece here, the seat, is a piece, and you can tell it's technically not part of the fuselage because it wiggles, aside from the fact that it's a different color. Um, but it's seated in there well enough, I can't even pry the plastic open enough to pop it out and then force it back in. Uh, in which case, I'm making the decision to mask off the seat. Um, there can be two ways to do that, one with tape, um, and one with a masking fluid, and I may use a combination of both. Uh, the reason why I'm not painting the seat for this is the same reason that I'm keeping the other ancillary parts like the uh, engines and the skis and the missiles uh, unpainted is because the color that I would use to make them uh, part of the Slaughter's Marauders team is extremely close, if not bang on. So when uh, I choose to not paint a certain part, I realized that, uh, much like I've said to you before, I want to try and match the sheen if it's required of the other plastic. So when I'm done painting, I want to put on a clear coat that matches the sheen of this. Uh, I say most of the time because there are examples of vehicles where because they use different plastics for different parts, the sheen is not the same. Um, and for those of you joining us for the first time, uh, I like to match the Hasbro aesthetic, right? My whole philosophy is clean paint application as if Hasbro had taken the Skyhawk and much like they did with Sky Patrol, released it as parts of other teams. So in this case, I'm going to make it Slaughter's Marauders. Um, Slaughter's Marauders is a ground assault force and I'm well aware of that. However, the camouflage looks cool and it'll look even cooler on this. So we'll call this air support for Slaughter's Marauders. Much like the Grizzly was, you know, recce and some close air support as well. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. And it's always fun to make up a story for this stuff, right? Or else it, uh, well, that's half the fun. It's half the fun, having a story. So, um, some parts will stay their base, uh, not this green color, but the base color of the green. And if you haven't seen the Grizzly video yet, uh, it was important to note that of the color selection, which will remain the same for this build, and I'll go over that as well, um, the plastic itself was dyed a dark green color. Uh, and the dark green color I'm using for this is, to me, is XF26 Deep Green. And the whole body will be this color, uh, if it was a real Hasbro toy, right? It would, instead of being this olive drab color, it would be this dark green. And we're going to have to paint our, our vehicle to look like that. So normally with airbrushing, it's usually a common practice to uh, paint the lightest color first and then paint the darker colors over top of it. So for example, if this was gonna be a light tan and a dark brown, I would paint the whole thing light tan first and then put the dark brown camouflage splotches over top of it. But like anything that's art related, there's more than one way and there's more than one style. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paint the whole thing the dark green color that it normally would be if it was a real Slaughter's Marauders vehicle. And I'll paint the other colors, including the lighter green, on top of it. Um, the other consideration for this is that I had the most success with the, let's call it the brown color on the vehicle, by mixing uh, Game Colors Terracotta with Vallejo Model Colors Dark Grey. Um, when I did the Grizzly, uh, I tried matching it with a single bottle, and quite honestly, the color of Slaughter's Marauders there, um, it's different than on the figures, and 
while it's more of a terracotta color on the figures, in this case on the vehicle, it's actually almost a purple brown. I know that sounds weird, but as you start getting more practice with colors and trying to match colors, you'll see that your vocabulary will change. So I would never have called that a purple brown or whatever, you know, a few years ago. But now that I'm used to it and I'm training my eye to see the color I see, not what my brain thinks it is, um, your world will open up. And, and so is mine. And a neat trick to try I learned from a professional artist was go outside and look at a tree and ask yourself what colors it is. Uh, most people say, well, the trunk is brown and the leaves are green or the pine needles are green or whatever. Um, but actually look at it and don't think of bark as brown. Just rattle off the colors you see the trunk is. And you might be surprised, maybe even mind blown, about the colors that are inside of a tree. So, um, anyways, neat trick, a little philosophical, but uh, once you learn how to start doing that, it can help you greatly in your color choices and starting to mix colors together. Uh, I'm still learning. Um, I know people that are very good at it and they say, oh yeah, that red's got a lot of, you know, brown in it or yellow in it or even a color you wouldn't expect. Like, oh, that's a very, you know, turquoise red. And you're like, what the heck's going on? But anyways, it will eventually make sense. Uh, and worst case, right? Like with anything else, even when you're working on your custom, if you try something and it doesn't work, then it's not a failure. You just learned that that's not the right answer yet. And you'll discover it, right? That's what all this is about. I mean, I'm discovering new stuff as I'm making these uh, vehicles with you. And I've done, you know, a fair amount of custom. So um, that's all part of the process and part of the journey, which makes it super exciting. So um, that's where we're at. I'm going to show you, uh, while we're going to do this one together, um, and it's going to be Slaughter's Marauders, the soft camouflage example uh, at the end of the video, at the end of the series, will be a vehicle I've already completed. Um, it was an experiment for, for me and for you, so I could show you how to do it. And we'll talk about um, some camouflage styles actually right now. So um, we, we're familiar with Slaughter's Marauders. Um, we know it's that kind of very straight line, wedge-shaped camouflage. Um, it does have a pattern, right? It goes uh, dark green, brown, light green, brown, dark green, brown, light green, brown, etc. And it will match up to the color of whatever, let's say for example, the Lynx, which is the Wolverine with the, the Mahler cannon on it. The whole bottom is that base dark green. So the dark green starts in the front as part of that pattern. And they made sure that they ended the pattern with dark green in the back so it matched uh, on the edges the dark green of the bottom of the vehicle. So um, Slaughter's Marauder's camouflage pattern is relatively easy. Now, the thing with camouflage is that <clears throat> different countries do it different ways. And while that example may seem obvious, where you look at something like um, traditional American woodland camouflage, right, the splotchy camouflage, um, there are different patterns out there. And those patterns come from different people's minds. So um, I've heard of clover pattern camouflage. You have that German flecktarn stuff from the Cold War. Um, you have British DPM, which is disruptive, disruptive pattern material or something like that. Um, and you've got desert camouflage, like the chocolate chip pattern that they call uh, from Desert Storm back in the day. Um, and different countries have different philosophies, right? So in this case, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that the other example I'm gonna show you is from UK's Action Force. Um, so when you're looking at your subject matter, we talked about the G.I. Joe APC. The Action Force version of that in the UK is actually called the ATC, and it's a completely different colored vehicle. It has a completely different interior and a completely different turret than the G.I. Joe APC that North Americans know and love. So the camouflage pattern on it may not equate to something you're used to. So what that means is if you're looking to replicate something, then you need to study that pattern and see what it is and practice it on something before you commit to it to plastic. Um, and that may be harder than you think because depending on what you're used to or what in your mind when you hear the word camouflage, what that looks like as a pattern, uh, regardless of color, this camouflage pattern is different. So um, you have to think more and be more conscientious of your application of camouflage uh, than you might otherwise be if you were just making some disruptive pattern. At the end of the day, if you don't care and you're not trying to match a team, then fill your boots and get creative. Um, if you would like to test the limits of your sanity, try doing digital camouflage without decals. Um, 
but that's the size of it. And we will talk about the UK Action Force uh, in greater detail, and I'll show you the example uh, when it's time. So in the meantime, we know we have to um, clean this off, and we did. So the other consideration, aside from a broken peg to fix, is this sticker was in good condition, and it was mounted a little bit higher than I would personally like, but I think that's nitpicking, and it works just fine, and it's still, like I said, and you can see here yourself, um, it's not peeling or anything, so why waste a, a sticker, right? I have a set of Skyhawk stickers for this particular project, which does have this. So if our efforts to protect it don't work, then we can just get rid of it and replace it. But if not, then we have a really cool uh, cockpit deck sticker for another project, right? And I don't know about you, but I love that sticker on Skyhawks. I mean, the detail with the buttons and the dials and the gauges is just fantastic. And because there's no cockpit glass for this canopy, you always see it. So it's such a nice detailed piece. So I like saving that whenever I can, um, which allows me to uh, save any spares I have for other projects, um, not just limited to a Skyhawk. So why don't we uh, start off with that? I'm gonna get some styrene uh, rod and tube together and we'll see if we can fix that up right quick. So just hang tight and I'll be right back. Okay, I found a piece of styrene rod in my drawer of plastic. Um, that I think is the right diameter. And all I did was I held it uh, in line with the peg here and it seems to be the same diameter. Plus I held it up to the uh, broken part of the canopy here uh, and I also get a reasonable warm and fuzzy. Um, the good thing is, is that we're gonna try all this out. Um, the other way you can check too is, does it fit in the hole it's supposed to go in? And in this case, it absolutely does. So we're off to the races. Now, before, when we were building the deck guns on the Dreadnought boat, uh, we used styrene tube. This is styrene rod. So the difference being that this is solid. There's no hole in the middle. The advantage to that is that it allows me to shape the end of it. Uh, why? Well, we want to make it as close to the original as possible, and that's got a rounded tip on it. Um, would you need to? Not necessarily. Um, we could certainly do a, a trial with rod and just have a slightly longer piece in there and see what happens. But um, I want to get you guys used to replacing parts and fixing parts so that they look as close to the original as possible. Because in some cases, uh, form follows function or function follows form, potato, potato, tomato, whatever. Um, so if we can get that part blended in and looking the way it was intended to function in the first place, we're certainly minimizing risk for altering the functionality of something. Um, and in this case, we're not necessarily gonna be opening and closing the cockpit a lot, unless we're putting figures inside, but um, it will sit properly as well, right? So um, by using that, uh, that technique, we're kind of minimizing the guesswork and whatnot. So what we have to do is take some sandpaper and round the edge of this uh, styrene tube. And right now, I just gotta find the appropriate bit as much like paint, I have an assortment of sandpaper in various forms. Um, it's almost insane, almost, but uh, it's required. It's required. You build model airplanes, you're gonna need sandpaper. So I'm just gonna take this nasty piece of work right here. And the reason why we're rounding it off first is because the piece I'm cutting is gonna be very small. So why would I wanna pinch a small piece in my thumb and try and round it off when I can just round off the tip right away, okay? So I'm just going to run this along the sandpaper here. Let's see if I can get a good angle so you can see. And all I'm doing is I'm creating that rounded edge. And you can see, um, I don't know how well you saw the tip in the first place, but it's already, there we go, starting to take shape. So we're just gonna keep going. This is the one thing about sanding I learned is that um, especially for building models, and you'll probably encounter this once you uh, start tackling more difficult projects to restore and, and or customize, is uh, let the sandpaper do the work. That's what it's there for. Um, holding it, you know, 
doing it faster and harder, so to speak, um, doesn't get you better results. It just tires you out. Uh, let the sandpaper do the work. And I'm constantly turning and changing the angle and direction of which I'm sanding. And all that does is that uh, if you're sanding on a flat surface, uh, or any surface for that matter, whatever it is you're doing, you're imparting that pattern onto the, uh, or that shape onto the uh, styrene. So um, you could even take it and hold it like this if you wanted to in your hand so it's softer, a softer surface to sand on. Um, and I'm barely touching it. It's almost like I'm scratching it like I was trying to write something. Um, and you can see there, we're starting to get that nice rounded tip there. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare it to the other piece. There we go. And I would say we're, we're there. Uh, yeah, let's call that. So there it is. Now we've got our tip rounded. I'm gonna put the styrene down and we're gonna look at the canopy. Now, the one thing that took me a long time to do was get used to the fact that, oh, it's broken, I wanna fix it and do the least amount of work possible to fix it. So you're not damaging, you think you're damaging it more by taking more off. But what we want to do is give ourselves uh, a nice flat, uh, even surface with which to attach the new rod to. So I'm going to sand that as well. And while you can use uh, the same sandpaper, I'm going to be a little bit of a smart guy. If my sandpaper allows me to, there it is. And I'm going to shape it a little faster just by using a rougher grade. Um, I find that rougher grades of sandpaper are good for shaping uh, and uh, finer grits of sandpaper are good for smoothing and final work. Um, and that's just the nature of the beast. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to take down this uh, part of the cockpit so that, or this part of the uh, canopy hinge so that it's as flat as I can make it. And while it seems like, yes, I'm technically damaging it more by removing more of this original plastic, I'm making my life easier by giving myself a good mating surface for the replacement part. So that seems to be okay. It's maybe a little bit of an angle in the vertical there, so I'm gonna sort that out. Now, yeah, m smart money would have me do this on a uh, flat surface, but this particular angle is so weird to work with that I couldn't necessarily get it on camera. So uh, I'm willing to accept that risk. And always check your work often, right? Especially once you get down to the finer uh, bits of your sanding. Um, always do a few strokes and then check your work. A few strokes and then check your work. Because uh, you can always take off more, but you can't put it back on. Which we're kind of proving is a lie because somebody took off the pin here and we're putting it back on. But um, it's just one of those sayings that goes uh, to keep you in mind of making less work for yourself. And this is making less work because then I don't have to putty so much um, and cut weird angles into the rod. <laughs> there we go. And the other thing bonus with working with rough sandpaper is because we're going to glue this, I want a rough edge in there for the glue to bite into. It's not always required, um, I found, but honestly, does it hurt? Nope. So there we go. We've got a nice, uh, well, at least according to my eye anyway, the camera could be lying, <laughs> making me a liar. But I think we've got the exact kind of surface we want there. So now what we're going to do is measure how long we need to make it. And we're going to do that because we basically sanded it flush with the bracket that it's going to attach to. Pardon me, I'll get this in focus for you. There we go. Because we've sanded it practically flush with that bracket, all we have to do is measure how long it is coming out from that bracket. Um, and you can use any number of tools. Uh, I'm a from the hip kind of guy. I'm not a super precise down to the micrometer sort of person. So I will hold it there steady. And then I'll just mark it off with uh, a pencil. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself just a little bit more for fudge factor. Just a little bit more. So that's a good mark right there. Then I'm going to take my X-Acto knife. And I'm going to lay this flat on the ground. And I'm going to put my blade over that mark. 
And then what I'm doing now, what you can't see is I'm leaning over it to make sure that the cut's gonna be vertical. We want this cut to be as clean as possible as well, which is also why I gave myself a little bit of extra material to allow for the fact that it might not be a straight cut because I'm a human being. And there you have it right there. There's our little nubbin that we're gonna replace. Um, you may wonder, is it worth it? Um, and quite honestly, I haven't repaired all of these Skyhawk cockpits that I've customized. Um, but in this case, I wanna show you how to do it. And in this case, I'm saying, yes, it's totally worth it. And then what you can do is all I'm doing is I'm rotating it in place because, oh yeah, there we go. Because here's what happens. Right? I used an uneven surface to sand that, which I'm fine with. And because I'm a human being and I cut this, this probably isn't gonna be perfectly a straight cut either. So I'm just rotating it on there to see if there's actually, if the two unevennesses <laughs> match up. And hooray, they do, weird. It's almost like science. So if I had my way, we're gonna use crazy glue for this. Um, this is Gorilla Super Clear. Um, We've talked about a little bit about glues in the past, and I'll, so I'll say it again because it's pertinent for this project, definitely, is you'll need different kinds of glues, bottom line up front. If you did everything with super glue, honestly, you'd be fine, um, but some plastics may not react well with other glues. Um, there are horror stories in the model building world of certain plastics melting when you touch them with certain glues. Certain glues are designed to melt the plastic to bond them together, and you may not want that on your vehicle. Um, especially given the fact that this stuff is old. Um, what does that mean? Well, the plastic's brittle, its chemical composition is compromised or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and that's all there is to it. I'm gonna get silent here while I concentrate. Now I'm just checking. This stuff sets reasonably quickly. But there's still some working time in there. So now I'm just making sure that it's flush. As much, well, as much as it can be, right? As much as it can be. And I'm trying to keep this thing in focus for you, but my hands have to move sometimes faster than the camera can adjust, so. Uh, and there it is. So I'm not gonna touch that, but as you can see, I would say that's a pretty good replica. It's maybe a little bit longer than the other side, uh, I'm not overly concerned about that unless it leads to a functionality problem, in which case I'll show you how we can change that later. Um, but there's your pin. So if I were to leave it like this, I would insert this side first when I'm in, reattaching the cockpit and then put the shorter side in because the, the, the original pins actually don't hold it that strongly in there. So uh, we're going to leave that for now to set, but there's your repaired canopy and that's all that it took. Um, there's another method you may have heard about called drilling and pinning in which case we would have taken a micro uh, drill and put a hole in each piece and a, cut some diam uh, some metal rod to length and shoved it in there too to make it extra strong. But I don't think we need to go down that road for this. Um, I think what we've done is more than good enough uh, until it proves me wrong. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, there's our repaired canopy. So let's call it there for now because I've got to let that glue clear. Plus I've got to get this seat all taped up so we can start priming and stuff. And you watching me tape that seat would be the definition of, uh, oh, I don't know, vicarious pain. So um, I don't want you to hear me cry off on camera anyway. So I'm gonna get that seat painted up. Um, get your products ready and whatever you need to do for your um, for your custom coming up. And I'm hoping that you're following along, especially if you're doing it with a Skyhawk, because these things are so much fun. Um, but regardless of what you're doing, what I wanna do is say thank you to all my subscribers. I really appreciate the, uh, the faith and for all folks that are here new watching for the first time, like I said, welcome to Talking Hands Customs. And please like and subscribe. And thanks for watching. So until next time, be safe and have fun.